All right, everyone, welcome back. My name is Daniel Orion, and this is still our guide to spider identification, episode two. Today's episode is all about orb weaver spiders. They're some of the coolest spiders out there, and I honestly, at this level, get surprised how many people are unable to recognize these. And so in order to help you not be one of those people, this episode is for you. Now, what is an orb weaver spider? It's basically a common name for all types of spiders that make this web. Orb in the English language means basically like a sphere or a circle, and the webs are basically made of a lot of different circles. Now, I'm expecting Explaining this, but showing you the web, a lot of you guys will probably recognize this spider web as just a spider web. This is what we're known, this is what we know spider webs to look like, more or less. In fact, if you Google up the term spider web, this is basically the first results that I took a screenshot of on my screen. They are practically all orb webs spun by orb weaver spiders. Isn't that interesting? So we almost take for granted how these beautiful orb webs are just universal to spiders, but they really aren't. They belong to this group of spiders called orb weavers. Most of them are in the family Aranaidae, although there are a few from other uh, families out there that build these orb webs. And these orb webs are actually very unique when it comes to spiders, even though those that build webs. To illustrate this, let's take a look at a comparison between a web spun by an orb weaver spider and one spun by a cobweb spider. Let's think about it from this perspective. What are what types of animals are each of these webs trying to catch? Because remember, all spiders are carnivorous, so they get their food from other animals, usually bugs, that they catch and eat, right? Do you think these types of webs would be catching the same prey? Probably not. Now, most spiders that build webs that are not orb weavers uh, build their webs closer to the ground to catch anything that might walk into them, like a beetle, for example, or an earwig, or some type of caterpillar. But orb weavers are different. They're unique among spiders because they specialize on in catching things in the air. Here we see two examples of a Orb weaver spider devouring both a moth and then on the right even a bat. Wow, yeah, some orb weaver spiders can grow pretty massive. So, this is what the orb webs are for. They're two dimensional, right? Uh, and they're strung up in a vertical way so that you, you the, they are designed to catch prey that is flying along a vertical path. Now, here's a little bit of taxonomy about what um, where orb weavers are found. Uh, this isn't super relevant if you're not super into it. I just need, wanted to bring it up just to show in each video how each spider is a little bit different than the last. Awesome. So, let's go over a few things about orb weaver spiders here. Orb weaver spiders are exceptional spinners. Uh, some of them, if not most of them, they actually have some of the strongest spider silk in the world. They make flat, two-dimensional spiral webs specialized for catching prey that flies through them. If a spider is in an orb web, it's basically an orb weaver. Uh, and that's one of the things that I really want to communicate, is that these, these webs that we all think of as the typical shape of a spider web, they're really unique. <laughs> they're not just all spiders make these types of webs. If a web, if a spider is in an orb-shaped web that is uh, suspended in the air and looks like it's meant to catch things that are flying through them, that is an orb web made by an orb weaver spider. Orb weaver spiders are fantastic pest control because they eat all of these uh, flying insects. And uh, they also might make webs in places where we can unfortunately run into them. I know I myself have at least one memory as a child of accidentally running into an orb web and it was not a fun experience for myself or the spider. So we do want to be careful when we're running around in the darkness sometimes in orb weaver territory. Uh, finally, I want to bring up <clears throat> this very relevant question about uh, how dangerous orb weaver spiders are and how to identify the ones that we should be worried about. Luckily, I have an excellent graph 
that depicts exactly how many of these orb weaver spiders are dangerous to humans. And we can find it on this slide. Oh, silly me. There actually are no dangerous orb weaver spiders. This is going to be a common theme among spiders, spoiler alert. Not many of them are considered medically significant. So that is the term we use for when a spider holds venom that if it is injected into a human being, it might be cause for medical concern and might warrant a hospital visit or uh, medical treatment, basically. I can count on one hand, basically, the amount of spider families that hold medically significant, significant members, and the orb weaver spiders have none of those. Which is good news for us, because once you know how to identify orb weaver spiders, you know not to be that worried about them. People who have been bitten by orb weaver spiders have cited that the venom, the pain from the bite, is even less than that of a bee sting, if you want a, a clearer perspective on that. So let's talk a little bit about why, because I think there's a good reason for why orb weaver venom is actually so weak. Take a look at this matchup right here. Uh, this is a scorpion eating a rather large cockroach. Now, uh, in this image, the cockroach has already been subdued. It is already dead. It is being consumed. But imagine what happened leading up to this moment. This was a little bit of a wrestling match, right? The scorpion is clearly bigger, but not by that much, as you can see. Now, if this scorpion did not have the venom that is in its tail to subdue its, uh, its, uh, its prey, this cockroach would have been spending all of that time and effort trying to get away from the scorpion. And the scorpion would have had to use his little claws to make sure that that cockroach stayed in place because if it gets away that's its dinner that's its food for the closest thing it's going to find for maybe weeks right so it's very very important for this animal to have the means to subdue an animal like this so that it can't get away let's contrast that real quick to an image of this orb weaver spider that is about to feed on this wasp looks like a yellow jacket now i don't care if this spider isn't even venomous this wasp is screwed. It is not going anywhere. It is completely tied up, right? And that is one of the, the seemingly magical properties that spider silk is able to bestow upon these spiders, right? It gives them these superpowers that make it so if it gets to entangle something, it just keeps getting worse and worse for the prey to the point where it's just, you can't escape it. Now, here's one cool little fact about orb weaver spiders is that there is only one known family of spiders in the world that has lost its venom completely. I like to tell people that basically all spiders are venomous. However, it isn't exactly true. There is one family, Uluboridae, that actually lost its venom capacity. And wouldn't you know it, that family actually spins orb webs. So this, um, let's say, strategy of catching prey is so efficient that even a spider with no venom is able to pull it off and be completely fine. There is no other style of predation by spiders that have allowed for this evolutionary uh, phenomenon where the spider could just lose its venom and then be totally fine. Thought it's an interesting point to bring up. So lastly, here in this video, I wanna go over what these spiders actually look like because Let's not forget, the web is going to be the dead giveaway, but there are some commonalities that a lot of these spiders have, even though it is such a diverse group of spiders that you can look for. Now, the most common spiders by far, orb weaver spiders, by where I live, are these small-bodied uh, spiders that are usually, they have their abdomen uh, that is bigger than their cephalothorax, so their back part. Their legs are uh, long, but they're not, they're not, um, they're pretty average, I'd call them, for a spider. And they usually have these little hairs on them. Not always, but a lot of species do. And uh, that is because their cephalothorax and their legs can kind of be folded un into or under or tucked right next to their abdomen to make themselves look smaller when they're not in prey-catching mode. For example, if you're nocturnal, you want to just... Uh, chill out during the day. If you're diurnal, you want to just uh, sleep during the night. And these spiders don't typically have their webs out 24-7. And so uh, this applies to general like like uh, Araneos gas, ooh, Gastrocantha and Neoscona. 
these are going to be some typical spider body shapes that you'll want to be looking out for. So if you ever find an orb weaver spider that isn't in its web, these are some of the things you want to be looking for. Unless, of course, they belong to some other genera like the Nephila and Argiope. These are going to be the huge orb weaver spiders because the ones we saw on the previous page, these are, those guys are small. They're about as big as your fingernail and they don't generally grow bigger than that. These guys right here, they can sometimes outgrow your hand. <laughs> that is how large they are. And they are orb weavers too. They spin these beautiful orb webs just like their smaller counterparts. I find that they're usually yellow or orange in sections where they're not dull colored or black. Um, scientists think that they're trying to mimic the coloration of venomous hymenopterans like wasps so that things know to stay away from them and not eat them. Usually when they're found in their webs, they have their legs spread out. And uh, unlike their smaller counterparts, their abdomen isn't quite as round. It's actually more tubular. It, it's uh, a lot longer than it is thicker. Their cephalothorax also happens to be white or gray or sometimes black a lot of the times. So the color is usually found on the abdomen and sometimes the legs. Lastly, uh, these are some less common orb weavers that you might run into, but they're called the tetragnathidae. It's the name of the family of the long-jawed orb weavers. It's a little tricky to see, but if you can see the guy on the bottom left of the pictures right there, you can see how his fangs uh, look really long, abnormally so, and that's where they get their names. Now, they're technically in a different family. Tetragnathidae is different from Aranidae, and that's why it's a little bit complicated. Uh, not all orb weavers just fit neatly into one family. Uh, on the right side, we've got the orchard orb weavers from the genus Lukaugi, and they are also technically long-jawed orb weavers, although uh, they look very unique to me. They're usually a shade of green, um, their legs are skinny, they hold different positions to other orb weavers, but they're still orb weavers, you can still find them in those cool orb webs, so those are two things that you might look out for. I very, very rarely see either of these two. Anyway, that's going to conclude our lesson on orb weaver spiders. Let's recap real quick. In order to tell that a spider is an orb weaver, the number one thing to look out for is, is this spider in a web? And if so, is that web an orb web shape? The one with all of the spirals, right? A really cool looking one that's designed to catch flying prey. We did go over a lot of other factors to tell uh, from body shape, which spiders might be orb weavers, but because this guide is designed for beginners, that's really only to throw out there, not so much because I expect everyone to memorize that, but just because we want to cover cover all of our bases, right? Now, do we remember how many of these orb weavers are dangerous to humans? Absolutely none of them. <laughs> Their bite, uh, venom, is uh, lacks a lot of potency when it comes to harming primates like ourselves. And they're very beneficial uh, pest control. So if you see them in our gardens, you might want to let them stay. <laughs> and that is going to wrap up our episode on orb weavers. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something helpful, and I hope you all go out there and treat nature with respect because you never know when it's going to come and help us out. Again, thanks a lot, and I'll see you guys for the next episode.